thank you all and congratulations. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you. Um, I will leave plenty of time for your questions, but um, I'm just going to start by asking Jane to tell us about how you discovered um, this 1967 novel that isn't that well known, maybe. Well, my dad's um, second wife, Judith, is a great book reader, as a lot of New Zealanders are, actually. And uh, she sent me the novel just by way of, like, um, you know, here's a great book uh, you might like to read. And um, it was just finishing the Top of the Lake series and just I just read it as you do a novel. And um, unlike many novels I read nowadays, I actually sort of got more excited the further I got into it and sort of found that the whole experience of reading this book was um, thrilling. Um, felt like it was written by someone that really knew the world. And um, at the back of the book, there's a, actually an afterward by Annie Pru, which uh, is really helpful in understanding the context in which uh, Savage wrote the book. And um, yeah, it was just, I didn't think about making a movie or anything like that. And it, but the, the point was that I just kept thinking of the themes in the story, like over the next few weeks. I, I really, um, I, I found it kind of haunting. Mm -hmm. In a, in a really good way. And so um, I just started taking more and more steps to find out um, more about it, like were the rights available, you know, for example, and uh, mm -hmm. went on like that, yeah. What were some of the themes that haunted you? Well, I think it, it's clearly um, a really complex way of approaching masculinity, you know, because mm -hmm. of its setting on a, a ranch where it's normally <laughs> um, a place where the values of masculinity are, are, are really highly valued. And um, I think, as you've seen the film, um, there's some surprises about what people are, are keeping secret. And, um, you know, I think the pain of, of um, well, those expectations around masculinity and, I mean, try not to use the word toxic masculinity, but um, I, I, I think it gave such a great sort of um, container in a way for studying and, and thinking and rethinking of, about the, you know, the men in this world because, of course, the, um, Phil Burbank is uh, such an interesting study in masculinity and yet also the character that Cody plays, Peter, Mm -hmm. is is another you know he's um he's uh, very feminine in the sort of his feminineness he's comfortable with it in a way that um your character <laughs> finds it really uncomfortable <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah did you all read the book um the actors yeah yeah it's an amazing amazing read um you know, I, I, I always hope uh, in adapting a book that one of the offshoots might be that people will pick it off the mm -hmm. shelves and rediscover it or discover it for the first time. It's got this amazing terseness in it, this poetry, this sort of um, kind of savage, violent beauty to it. Yeah. And yet it tackles incredibly complex themes mm -hmm. in an era in which it was written in a very deft way yeah. um, that rings very loudly to a modern sensibility sure um he can surmise a character in a line a, a story in a page in a world in a chapter it's it's very beautiful writing mm -hmm. yes yeah, so the book actually begins with the description of castration which puts you right at the center yeah of you know yeah, it's these, the first these, paragraph these, yeah. um yeah. things of masculinity because on a ranch of course they don't allow the masculinity of the animals to yeah. exist just like one or two bulls and yeah. The rest get castrated. I'm just remembering. So I, <laughs> I, I carry around the book with me quite a lot. I haven't actually bought it, it but I, it's covered in dirt because I was really, I was the annoying actor bringing it to set all the time. <laughs> he, he was the annoying actor. <laughs> um, uh, I was always the annoying actor. Well, I was in character, so of course I was annoying. <laughs> um, and um, it, it's, it's a masterful blueprint. So sort of as far as approaching the role, for me anyway, I, I, I found it opened up a hell of a lot of understanding of film, mm -hmm. the complex building blocks that make him. Kristen and Cody, do you want to weigh in on the book or? 
I feel like Jane added more to Rose than yeah. more richness um, than what was on the page yeah. for me. So, you know, a little bit book, a lot of Jane, and then me, myself, and I. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't have too much more to add, but of course, there's there's so many more layers and um, a lot more that you can explore, I guess, as a book, um, in, in the book. But yeah, again, like as you said, there was a lot more depth and a lot more things that we could explore in our own little secrets that, that we could create as uh, motivations and intentions for the characters in bringing it to life. Yeah, Cody and I had the secret that he killed his father and oh. that was, but that was our own secret. Did you know this? <laughs> Halfway through, I was told. <laughs> <laughs> that was our secret creepy mother and son connection. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, they didn't really do that, right? We did. <laughs> I'm um, proud of that. She's not proud of that. <laughs> I don't believe it. Jen, you've, you've adapted... Um, you know, you've, you've, you've adapted books for uh, cinema before. Um, and I think even the, the films that you have in this, there's always been, I think it's quite a strong literary influence. So can you talk about the process of turning this into a screenplay? Um, it, I, think, I think Kirsten is right that you do more with the character of Rose than is in, in the book. But there are other aspects that are quite faithful in terms of the certain, you know, family dynamics and psychology and... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love the book, so that was really a great help and a challenge as well. And I also um, worked with my f dear friend and colleague, Tanya Sagechian, who was incredibly helpful in um, discussing the structure and how what we might leave out and what we were going to keep in. We, we decided we didn't want to have flashbacks to another time and try and tell it all in one time and make that a kind of a rule. But the, the story is haunted by, as you know, Bronco Henry, and he's a character that's very, very big for the story, but who we never see. And it was like trying to come up creatively with ways um, to have that understood or felt or discovered, um, which is sort of easy in a book, mm -hmm. but really difficult or things had to change and had to be created mm -hmm. um, in order for us to be able to keep remembering how important um, this uh, ghost lover was for a uh, story and for Phil Burbank. And, you know, and I think in the end, of course, this, the, those themes of the ghost, like for Cody's character, Peter, that, you know, Phil, I think, is going to be his Bronco Henry. Right. So it's that um, when you have to suppress your true feelings in your love, um, it's safer to love a ghost, you know. There's one interesting choice I was going to ask you about, this voiceover that we only hear at the beginning and then it sort of drops out. Like, wh why have that only at the beginning? Well, I wanted to steer the um, people's attention towards Peter because we mm -hmm. see him only very briefly mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of the film and um, then he's off at school before he comes back. But I want them to know... Right. That so you know, in the back of their brain somewhere, I don't know if it works. I think mean, I think most people can't remember what was said, but I tried to keep it. I had one more complicated version of mm -hmm. it, which I think had a lot of um, great texture, but you couldn't remember it at all. But I think he's basically just saying, you know, you got to help your mother. Yeah. <laughs> and um, that that might just trigger a memory later, and just to know this isn't. You know, this isn't just going to be a story about um, two brothers that are not getting on anymore, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> Some flower making and other activities yeah. <laughs> happening. <laughs> the, the other thing about the book is that it is, it's often described as somewhat autobiographical. Um, so I don't know if you did much research into Savage's life and into yes, Montana yeah. and, you know, that period. And uh, Annie Prue really um, opens that up in the afterward that she wrote in the book. And um, Savage, and then we also met relatives of uh, Thomas Savage when we went and did some research and, you know, actually saw his ranch that he grew up in um, near Dillon uh, in southwest Beaverhead, uh, Montana. And, um, yeah, um, so he came to the, ra the ranch in a very similar way to Peter, like his mother married the brother. Um, and of, uh, at that time, Ed Brenner, who um, is actually 
the inspiration for Phil Burbank. And um, so there was quite a lot of similarities. And we did actually ask, is there someone who might have been Bronco Henry? And they did show us a picture of the person that they thought could have been that inspiration as well. Uh, so Savage was a gay, a gay man and he, at that time, um, wasn't obviously openly gay and he actually married. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I, I, I imagine that, you know, when I see the book, the photo of his and the jacket cover, he's like wearing the tennis shoes. <laughs> that's so important in the uh, profile for me, for Peter. So I just sort of went like, hmm. <laughs> he, I, I imagine he thought of himself as Peter in a way, but he also was a great horseman. <clears throat> And I broke horses, and actually his first thing that he wrote was about the breaking of a, you know, a bronco. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, I, you know, he certainly did have a very, uh, you know, a much more complex relationship to the um, romance about the West um, yeah. than, than um, most people did. Since we have, you know, um, <clears throat> the actors here, I was wondering if you can talk about just assembling this incredible cast for the film. Or maybe we can start with um, Benedict in a role of Phil. I mean, this is uh, a quite a quite different part, I think, for from anything you've played. I think it's I think it's just a very complex role. Um, and what made you think of of Benedict for this part? Was there a particular role? I, of I mean, I, I was thinking, of course, of, um, you know, like, who could it be? And Benedict is somebody whose work I've always really loved um, since I saw the Ford Maddox Ford um, Parade Great, Zand. Parade Zand. Yeah. yeah. And then your recent television series as well, which is amazing. And um, I, I just think he's a really good actor. <laughs> and um, that means a lot to me. And, uh, you know, looking for somebody that can take on this part without worrying about what everyone's going to think of them if they play, you know, a really course you do worry but <laughs> a really cruel man um, um, but you, I mean you need someone who really wants that challenge and um, Benedict you'd read the script I think and you, you said or you were whatever that you were interested and um, that meant a lot to me so we, we met didn't we yeah and uh, and also I think that Benedict's got this fantastic quality for showing Oh, actual ability to show vulnerability, which um, I think is so important for people connecting to a, a character like this. It could have been so kind of like could have been so put off, and just went like, oh, I don't want to know about this person at all, and I don't want to know anything more. But somehow, Benedict managed to bring you into the inner world of the character and some sort of compassionate relationship yeah. with his um, pain, you know. And then. Can you talk a bit about preparing you. for the role? <laughs> <laughs> it's very weird sitting here having Jane Campion talk about you like this, but very nice at the same time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can you say a bit about preparing for the role? I mean, obviously there's yeah. quite a few um, I yeah. don't know, t technical skills you had to pick up. Yeah, I won't bore you with a list of those. A lot of them didn't even make the film. Yeah. Some ironmongery and taxidermy that didn't make it. But... Um, <laughs> I, uh, I kid you not. Uh, whistling, whittling, horse riding. Yeah, it was it was a lot, and roping and ranching in itself. Um, banjo, all of that yeah. banjo playing, um, acting, acting, <laughs> a bit of schmacking in there. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, for, for me, it was about trying to time capsule, I suppose, to try and imagine myself back into that world, um, which required a lot of sort of subconscious work um, as well as conscious work, just sort of drip feeding the imagination. Over a long time, Jane gave me quite a lot of runway with this, which is a rarity in my life, which is a blessing for this role, because it was quite a sharp turn from a lot of things I've done before. Um, and yeah, to, uh, to how I started to do it, I, well, I went to Montana. Um, I did a sort of dude camp thing, which was great to try and get the dirt and the blood and the kind of sensation of what it must be like to be a body in that world doing that work um, with animals and uh, people and that culture. Um, a lot has changed since then, obviously. Um, but 
then it was about leaning in nearer production to costume and um, and Grant's work, our production designer, and Noriko's in hair and makeup, and with Jane collaborating to sort of piece together a kind of thing that felt good to move around in and to to see my environment and understand it. But yeah, all the time I felt like I was um, reaching, um, and then those lovely moments where you just stop reaching, you just let go. And Jane's brilliant at encouraging you to do that, to stop worrying about the homework and just be and let vulnerability come and something unspoken, which you can't really talk into a microphone about kind of happen. Um, and there was a lot of space and time to do that, which is again, a rarity. And that's, you know, all credit to Jane, Jane's, um, female gaze, but also her sensitivity as a human being and where she was directing the story and Ari's lens work and everything else going on around it. And these amazing actors, one of whom is not here on the stage, Jesse Plembers, or well, many of whom aren't here, but Jesse in particular, as my brother, um, to form a relationship with however odd and competitive it was with Kirsten. We hardly talked because we were in character all the time. So once we once I'd done that work, I was kind of trying to be him all the time. So we're, we're good friends now. But yeah, <laughs> we were friends on the weekend. We were friends at the weekend. It was very weird. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't take my home homework home with me. Um, <laughs> that is homework. I didn't take my work home with me. I'm very jet lagged after only a four hour time difference from LA, but I've just realized no, it's, it's, it's worse coming. It's weird, right? From LA, because it's like, oh, you got to wake up at eight. And yeah. Wake up at like, and it's sort of four in the morning or whatever. Yeah. So forgive me. I'm dribbling, but um, in my mind and in my body. But the fact that air conditioning is kind of like quiet in here. It's, yeah. It's like a womb. It's so respectful. This is such a New York audience. I love it. Um, but it is, yeah, I'm, 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 I think I'm living up to my gold standard of sending people to sleep. So I should, I should apparently I, I do audio books that send people to sleep. So if any of you suffer from insomnia in the it's city that never sleeps, just here. do click it. I'll do, maybe I'll do a read of the, of the savage novel. Maybe that would be a way to <laughs> lull yourselves to sleep after this. Thank you. Jane, why don't you talk about the other actors? Yeah, I just wanted to also mention Jesse yeah. Plemons because he's not here, but um, that was an absolute joy to work with him. And then you were really excited too, Ben, to work with Jesse. I think... He was the um, first... I mean, I, I, I yeah. didn't cast this film. <laughs> I tried to. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I did. I really pushed for Jesse. Um, he, did, yeah. I, I, he was the only person I imagined in the role from the beginning. Yeah. For some reason, he was just there. But Jesse wanted your role. <laughs> 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 Everybody wanted my role. But I, I think it's, it's uh, beautiful to work with an actor like Jesse. And I, I, of course, I'd noticed his work already. But when you're really there with him, you know, he, he's such a unique human anyway and such a unique actor that he just takes you like two degrees more grounded into a character than I think you really ever see anywhere else. And, I mean, Jesse also like had to try and get my hyperactivity into a zone where he could actually get to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> and he just sort of worked me and then you'd get me into the caravan and say, oh, you know, when you did this or that, you know, it wasn't so pleasant. And I was just so grateful that he would talk to you, you know, and um, work on the, f the friendship and the relationship. So I ended up, like, just loving him to pieces and feeling really connected to him. Because it is a job, you know, like, you don't... You don't just, like, you know, we're all doing quite complicated, difficult things and everyone feels quite vulnerable. So it is a job to make these relationships work, yeah. don't you think? And, I mean, my, I'm just completely willing because I know how much you guys put. <laughs> yeah, I I oh, okay, you when sorry. You, when you, when I'm you just <laughs> talk away from the microphone. Again, the years of doing um, audiobooks for people who can't sleep um, has taught me this. <laughs> anyway... Uh, we're sorry Jesse's not here. <laughs> I'm the most sorry, believe me. We'd be away from our kids in a nice hotel room. <laughs> yeah, and um, shall we talk about working together? Me and you, Jane? Yes. Yeah, I, well, Jane, Jane wrote me a letter in my early 20s about working together, and I saved it, and... Obviously, she's one of my favorite filmmakers and someone who her films were always, as an actress, something to, you know, to look forward to your, or not to look forward to, to um, kind of inspire myself as an actress with the type of work I'd like to do. 
um, in my own career. So Jane has always been someone, you know, one of the, the people at the forefront of those kind of performances for women. Yes, and I really um, was in love with the work that you did with Sophia, right back to Virgin Suicide. It was just so mesmerizing and beautiful. And then to see you in Melancholia, oh my God. That was a, a brilliant performance. And then yeah. to find out that you've got the same birthday as me, as yeah, does Lars von Trier. Know, <laughs> this is how women work together. <laughs> you have the same birthday. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same color hair. Um, um. No, and then we sometimes talk about the role, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did. <laughs> and Kirsten says to me, don't worry, Jane, I've got this, I've got it, you know. <laughs> I think it, um, yeah, we, there was a lot of difficulty actually playing a drunk person or a person that was drinking a lot. Yeah, you you, know? I think you told me to have Jesse, she, she's like, anytime you drink, just have Jesse record you. <laughs> right? Oh. I mean, we did it. Yeah. Believe me. Yeah, that was helpful. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Cody, I think it was, um, I think a discovery for most people in this film. I originally auditioned for Phil, actually. Really? Everyone wanted that role. Um, didn't get it, so that's okay. Um, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was really good. Uh, what's my name again? Peter. Peter, <laughs> Peter extremely layered character. Um, originally, reading it, I wouldn't have suspected that because he's somewhat on a secret mission until, like, the last kind of 10 pages, you, you really see that um, he pulls something else off, which is really what attracted me to the role and had me reading the script immediately again after the first time that I, that I read it, just to kind of go through and make sure that that's what I just experienced with this character. Um, so I saw that there was a lot to, to play with and pull from, and it would be an extremely challenging role, but a lot of fun as well. And um, after meeting Jane, I, I absolutely fell in love, and I feel that she saw a certain potential in me that um, she could kind of push me out of my comfort zone and, and the boundaries that I originally kind of had in terms of just character development and all that kind of stuff. And, and that's what she did. And, really? Uh, Tell absolutely. me how. I didn't realize that. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it's been something I've, I've spoke about a lot, and it's unfortunately been sound bitten sometimes in some of these uh, interviews, and I, it just sounds like I said she made me extremely uncomfortable. So I didn't mean that at all. <laughs> but um, no, just in terms of creativity, like we all, I guess, have our approach uh, when it comes to developing a character and creating a world for the character and, and understanding. Um, but I feel like if I went on this endeavor with just my own tools and my own approach, then it wouldn't have been anything near what I saw on the screen and, and the performance that I'm, I'm so proud of. Um, thanks to Jane, I feel like you, yeah, you just took me through uh, a lot of different techniques and, and, and nitpicked and, and pushed me, um, <laughs> yeah, out of my comfort zone I, in a good way. This is a very good modest story. young man because when he arrived, um, we just jumped straight into an improvisation. I was like, I, I, he came in the door and went, oh, my God, that looks like Peter. <laughs> um, and so I started to pretend like um, I was interviewing you or something as yeah. Peter. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, neither of us quite knew what was going on, but we went along with it. Yeah, know? we did. I believe there was supposed to be sides or something, and I thought it was a general meeting, yeah. and, and we so got I there. Just and we pretended just kinda... he was Peter and was asking him about his mother and questions, and mm -hmm. immediately I could just see how brilliant – Cody could be as this character and I was like so excited so I mean he was already fantastic I don't know these little bits I might have added I was like oh no absolutely nothing. but, but <laughs> I mean I, I was thinking like oh my god we've got a Peter that's better than the Peter in the book you know oh, that's so sweet <laughs> no I, I I am in love with his kind of more grounded less murderous side um <laughs> I, I relate to that. He's an intellectual. He's uh, he's a hermit. He's he's very alone, and he studies life, and he's passionate about life, and he's extremely curious. And he's one thing I really love about him is he's extremely courageous and confident in himself. Um, being someone who's extremely kind of a feminine myself, I feel like there was a lot I could take on and and learn about him, and just things that I had to experience in my own life. You know, my dad's like six foot six bikey covered in tattoos and that was something that I, I knew I was never really going to grow into or or be so um I had to kind of really 
embrace who I was in that same way that he did. So I, I really enjoyed playing that. I wanted to bring Ari in, and then we can take um, your questions. Uh, this is your first time working together, Ari and Jane? Yeah, we'd actually done, uh, we'd met kind of briefly on it. We did a commercial. Okay. It was a very, a very short shoot, but this is was definitely a, uh, yeah, a journey we'd not been on before. In case people don't know, I think Ari has um, shot, I think, some of the most striking films of the last few years, like um, Lady Macbeth and In Fabric. So, Jane, um, can you talk about deciding to work with Ari on, on this one and, and maybe just figuring out the visual, visual language for the film? Uh, I'd also seen some shots that Ari shot that I thought were really incredibly beautiful. The camera language in it was, like, stunning and... Having worked with her on the short, it was just like a little icebreaker, really, wasn't it? Yeah. And um, I, f I felt like, you know, okay, so this is a very masculine story in a way that I'm telling her and I don't want to abandon all the, the ladies. So I thought, oh, I'll have a female DOP and so, um, wouldn't it be brilliant if it could be Ari? <laughs> um, and that we could go on this adventure together. Um, and Ari was really open to the idea of a really, really long production, um, pre-production, which I think is absolutely vital in giving any project its uh, full legs. And we, we both knew it was a big stretch for both of us, I think. Yeah, but it was, I mean, incredibly enjoyable. Almost we started about a year before we shot, knowing we had to, knowing kind of more or less the location where we might shoot, we wanted to see it the time of year we were shooting. So that was a whole year before the cameras were rolling. We were walking up hills and down um, yeah. valleys trying to find the Burbank Ranch, find the mountain range that could be so iconic. And, uh, yeah, just also, like you were saying about the relationship, just getting to know each other because yeah. a, a film shoot is quite an intense experience um, and it's just such a can be so lovely when you've got a kind of friend and an ally versus someone you've really just met six weeks ago <laughs> um, yeah yeah I think we made really good friends I love Ari she's just <laughs> amazing and um, we we also spent a long time discussing the language of the film that we wanted to use photographically and you know trying to describe it and trying to think about it and sort of I think we got there <laughs> you know, we never quite put words to it, did we, really? But no, it was, also um, talked a lot about the characters. Um, I mean, Ari's a DOP that works from a deep interest in character and in story, which is, you know, lovely. And to me that's when the visuals are really embedded inside the, the, the mechanics and the, the themes of the story, everything then they're so much more meaningful than just looking beautiful. Yeah, I think the only, the most definition we kind of got to was to, um, for every frame, know what the information was and to have absolute kind of clari clarity of information, which seems quite simple, but to know what that information is, is quite a, um, a lot of attention to detail and work to know what what is the information at what point. Um, which seems, yeah, seems yeah. seems simplistic, but it's, um, yeah, to do that you need to know everything there is to know in the script to, to make There's the decisions. other side too, which is like not intellectual at all, like um, the work that you did with Benedict um, in the sacred place with the um, scarf where it was just me and you and Benedict and we didn't really know what he was going to do next and just had to be highly intuitive and sitting up a situation where you could, you know, try things yeah I mean Ari it, it, there was a yeah there was a huge amount of freedom with that to just ignore the trappings of a camera following your movement it just felt it felt yeah I felt unobserved I felt free to do what I needed to do in the space and yeah see what happens yeah I think that's one of the amazing things about you Jane that you allow everyone to be vulnerable and I think we all, the three of us, were in that kind of willowy glade at that point. We were all kind of vulnerable to and open to not knowing what was going to happen. Um, but to be know that there's kind of no such thing as a mistake, that there's just uh, take a risk and 
Uh, I really love that sequence. It's one of my favorites yeah. in the film. I just think that, you know, you just got to take risks and you just got to trust, you know. And that's, uh, there's no other, really other way around it. Okay, let's take some questions from the audience. Um, yeah, we can start here. Okay, talk about um, the question for Jane about working with Johnny Greenwood on the score. Well, of the Johnny film. Greenwood is a genius. It's just like uh, another word for it. Uh, and it's an absolute uh, pleasure to go through the process with him. And he really led it. I mean, after I heard a piece that he did called Water um, with the Australian Chamber Orchestra, Richard Tognetti, et cetera, and I, I didn't even know it was his. And I, I am a fan of his anyway. And I went like, shit, what's this? I think this could be for us. And it turned out to be Johnny Greenwood again. So um, we got an exemption from uh, financing in order to work with Johnny because I really felt we needed someone with his um, depth as a, as a composer. And, um, and uh, you know, I just think he's extraordinarily talented. And what he basically did was he um, built up um, a lot of suggestions. I mean, I was really just sharing what he was going to do because actually, um, you know, he'd say, I like horns or what about mechanical piano and um, what about violas? And, and I'd just go, yes, yes, you know, <laughs> try what, whatever you like. So he sort of created a palette of what he was feeling from the script. And um, my experience is it's much better for composers to work off their own instincts and intuitions and not actually have the film trying to fit themselves into that. And so he created a suite of pieces that he felt, you, you know, like a, a complete freedom to create. And we maybe had in the end about 30 or 35 of these pieces. And so that when we started editing, we started fitting them to pieces and parts of the film and then we'd share that back to him but really mostly these um you know you know we might be struggling with one or two cues that we had really high hopes for um and then some surprising things happen like we'd use half of one and half of another and they just sort of worked and he could bridge them um but it, it was a very interactive process and um after that he any of the like digital sketches that he made um or um, he replaced with actual instruments um, as much as possible. And um, he's, he's so modest and so easygoing. It was like, um, I was sort of like scared to ask for things. because, Like, oh, I'm not sure we quite got this moment. He'd say, oh, great, you know, like, give it to me. Like, I, oh, great, I want to do some more violins or I want to try this or I want to try that. I want to do some more strings. It was just like... Um, he really enjoyed any sort of challenge we threw his way and um, he, he was just beautifully modest. And we've been putting a book together about the making of this project and we decided to include the um, emails between him and me um, during the process and Tanya was also involved in it um, too. She actually plays piano and I don't read music or do anything so I feel quite vulnerable <laughs> talking to composers at times. Um, but he was never like that. It never made me feel less or anything of that kind. But it's, it's really interesting because we haven't met. In fact, we're going to meet in London for the first time because of working through the pandemic. It was just a very, very, very different situation. And, I, you know, it probably suited him really well because he's quite shy. But so we just had this massive Zoom relationship um, and email relationship uh, where I've become very, very fond of him. And, and I love what he gave us for this film and how it how it sits in there with it thank you okay uh yes over there I'll, I'll try to paraphrase i think earlier you were you said you didn't you were trying not to use the phrase toxic masculinity um and i think the question is about hmm? I, me? yeah oh, okay sorry yeah yeah, yeah too, i think <laughs> it was i think it was to you and it was about you i think you said you were trying said, trying not you to hear use that you hear that phrase toxic masculinity so much that you begin to wonder if it means anything. Okay. I mean, you know, I think we do know it means something. But <laughs> you just try to find another way to describe it. Yeah. I mean, I am really interested, interested in, um, well, both concepts of femininity and masculinity and how they play out in our lives, you know, because I believe it's in everybody and we all have both um, and also when we deal with the alpha males it's um, 
it's, it's painful. Um, they're so dominating. And um, I am interested in that because I have to put up with it. <laughs> Just, I suppose, maybe to follow up on that, a lot of people have, have pointed out that this is your first film that focuses on men. Um, but I do think that masculinity is a theme that you have explored in your film. So I don't know how much you, you see this as a departure from the other films. I do see this as a, um, a departure. In fact, almost like a bookend, you know, like if you look at mm -hmm. the piano, clearly looking at um, much more from a much more feminine perspective. Mm -hmm. I see this as a kind of bookend of a, another large, um, big landscape piece film exploring another kind of, uh, you know, yeah. masculine myth. Yeah. And, you know, Savage has helped, helped me um, find a piece, really, that I could feel really um, happy in. I mean, it took me a little bit uh, to find my feet in it. But, um, and, and also... You know, I did a lot of psyche and dream work just to help me really uh, explore that um, because I didn't want to stand back from it. I wanted to really go in there and, you know, from my point of view, imagine what um, Phil was feeling and they've been so suppressed, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, you know, it was a challenge and I really, uh, once I got, my, got in there and got dirty with it, I really enjoyed it. Can you and also, I think you know the the male actors that I'm working with, like they're just my friends, and um, it's really, you know, yeah, I don't know. It's just friendship can kind of just trump everything in a way. I think um, that there's a there's a way where we just sort of accept each other as individuals and personalities. Do you? I mean, I don't know. What do you think? Does it make a big difference being directed by a woman? Um. It's, uh, I, 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 I wasn't, a, you're not, I wasn't gender aware, at, you know, do you know what I mean? I'm just working with a really talented director and someone who I trust. Yeah. And of course you bring a sensibility which is about your life experience to your work. Mm. But um, I have worked with, with female directors before, um, not as many as male, but I didn't, I'm very glad it was you directing this film. That's all I can say about it. But mm. you, entire, your entirety, not just your gender. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Jane, you mentioned dream work. Can you elaborate on that? Um, yeah, I just was sort of trying to figure out a way to, um, I, you know, I actually felt quite a lot of fear before getting into the business of directing it um, and understanding these characters as well as you could because it's a real thing for me. Like, if I'm going to do something, I, I want to do it as well as I possibly can. I can't stand the idea of um, not... Um, giving this project what it needs. And I had this strong feeling that I, I needed to do some psyche work, like to, to get inside it and to, to really feel what, especially Phil Burbank was feeling and thinking. And so I worked with this woman called Kim Gillingham who's, um, yeah, who encouraged me to have these dreams. And so anyway, it was the most amazing work I've ever done and she's the, person that, the only person I think that's really helped me as a director too. Um, go very deep. She sort of facilitates this uh, dialogue between yourself and the character and say so, like all the things that you say are the, only the things you say. Yeah, it's kind of like therapy between you. For me, it's like therapy. Yeah. I do the same work, but with someone named Greta Seacat, who Jesse and I work with. We also do Well, dream, actually, that's Sandra Seacat's daughter, right? What? Uh, it's, it's Greta Sandra Seacat's daughter, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so she learned from her mother, but it's yeah. it's... It kind of feels like therapy between you and the person you're playing. So at the end of the day, you know who you're playing better than anyone else, which gives you a sense of groundedness in your work and yeah. also a sense of security to try yeah. anything. It gets that's, that's actually really true. Like have, having done the work, I did feel so much more grounded and confident. Yeah. Confident that I that I understood. And that your choices then you and, are yeah. completely like right on like you never will question yourself yeah. when you're filming yeah because it comes from such a, a, a sacred deep place in yourself you know mm -hmm. um the images and and you can't make them up can you no, i mean no, they're just a gift your, you yeah. know from exactly. somewhere else exactly. yeah. <laughs> yeah. your unconscious mind yeah yeah thank you <laughs> okay uh, i think we can take a couple more yeah all the way to the back yes 
I'll just um, I'll just uh, repeat it in case people didn't hear. Uh, a question from uh, somebody who's from Montana, uh, East and Montana. and East Montana. A question for um, Jane and Ari of conceiving of the landscape as a character. And we should add that you found these Montana landscapes in New Zealand. Um, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I picked them, Jane. <laughs> and uh, and then the questions for the actress about working. I guess against this 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 landscape. Jonas, yeah, it's a big uh, big big question. But yes, spoiler alert: um, we did shoot in New Zealand, um, uh, which sounds like is a good stand-in. <laughs> um, yeah, we spent a long time thinking in depth about finding the right places. But I don't know. I'm sure everyone has their own personal connection with the landscape in this film, but for me, um, that sense of scale and isolation was was mainly important. Um, I guess obviously the sense of place and Phil's relationship to the the mountains and the dog, but I don't, the way I kind of looked at it as well was that the, how important it was to set up the scale and isolation. I think also for Rose, when we meet her and she comes to this place that by the time she arrives, you as a viewer know that what, kind of place this is and just how remote it is and how you know and how much trouble she is that she's not going to get out of there in a hurry so I know the way I, the way I that was my kind of way in to set up the yeah the epicness the scale the brutality the remoteness for that kind of very particular reason I don't know what um Jane, did you? I, I, well, I come from it to from a, a bit more of a sensualist point of view. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the hills are really sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I just do all those folds and crevices, <laughs> hiding secret little streams and things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm in love with landscape in a in a, in a, in a very um, powerful way. Like it can get me trembling. Like I just love it. Um, yeah, and I, you know, I also agree with Ari that, you know, I did feel like these people were in the middle of an ocean, really, you know, like they were so isolated in the landscape. And, um, of course, I did go and see the landscape that is Savage's landscape in Beaverhead, Montana, and that's amazing as well, but actually not so amazing as the, um, you know, on his actual ranch as the, I think, the, um, the hills that we were filming with in the Ida Valley. Uh, just New Zealand, <laughs> New Zealand is kind of, this is a really weird place that sort of like uh, can stand in almost anywhere, like Middle Earth <laughs> and um, a Switzerland, now Montana, you know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, chameleon. I think also when yeah. you, sorry, go on. You... It's a chameleon, you know, like yeah. it really is like a landscape actor. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is another character. It's completely another. And I, 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 well, for Phil, Phil is the landscape. I mean, it, it's in him. He's the outdoors. He brings the outdoors indoors. So, for me, I had to sort of, literally, kind of lay in the earth for a while, just feel it, hear the grass, see the clouds move, feel the different temperatures. So I went to set a few times before we started filming, and. And that's a lot. I did a lot of that in Montana as well when I was out there. I, I, it, it, hugely important. You know, it's something that he's managed. It's one of the only aspects in his life that he has total control over this outward show of masculinity where he knows how to work the land and the people of the land and the animals uh, in any condition, uh, in any landscape. So to be able to get that familiar, I'm outdoorsy. That's definitely um, a box ticked as far as something I have in common with my character. Um, I love nature and that immersion in it, I think, was key for me to find him so it was it was my ally I, I felt it was something for nothing to have that as a backdrop and I was panicked about stepping out into a car park in Auckland doing you know set work um I was really worried about it because mm. it just it felt so natural being uh, on that mm. plane under the shadow of those hills and um yeah we got there yeah I think too that when you um when I see the film now I really see how um, Phil relaxes in nature, like you only see, you really see him um, calm, like without all the you know masculine front that he puts on. I think for the other cowhands and the you know the 
the um, alpha his, performance. His you secret know. spaces yeah, outside, secret his place, sacred places yeah, outside. Yeah, he's, he's at his most um, loose, relaxed, beautiful, yeah, natural. Yeah. All right, we're going to take one final question. Uh, yes, right there. I think everybody heard that, but just the, uh, the question is about I the, heard that. The, did you hear that? I, I heard, I, I, I did hear that. <laughs> did hear I heard question? every word of it. I thought it was very, um, um, the, the um, lady woman was saying, <laughs> asking um, about um, how I can, or how we conceived of the panning shot um, that um, bookended the, the film at the beginning and the end. Um, I think these, these sorts of visual rhymes are things that we're, you know, always aware of and looking for without over, um, like, setting them up in some sort of fake way. Um, and for, I think, Arian, we were very aware of it and we were discussing it, how it would work, um, like, to open the story with that and then to end with him like a quite a broken man looking for the boy with the rope um, on the way to the hospital. Um, and, I, yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's, you're always looking, as, as I was saying before, to try and find the language that will hold the film in, in a way that you can um, take it with you, you know, that you will remember it, that will help you um, review it in your mind later even. And, you know, f for me, that was um, just one of those rhythms that I thought would, you know, well, we both thought would work well, although it was quite hard to get it. I almost gave up. <laughs> because yeah, it was very your, tricky. Your, your team were brilliant. I was going, oh, for God's sake, this isn't going to work. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of those ideas that you have when you're sitting at your kitchen table with a nice cup of tea, th drawing, thinking this will be a great idea. And yeah, actually get to it, it's quite tricky. to achieve. You know, <laughs> you've got to have the track and then the panning and the yeah. everything and then they've got to be walking at the same pace. And <laughs> yeah, but I think one of the, I remember one of the things us talking about was to make sure that we obviously have kind of emotive images but but non not emotionally manipulative camera yes. moves. So no, we had yes. a rule about no... No camera moves that were emotionally manipulative, and that that we wanted a kind of hands-off kind of photography that would. The idea you can watch um, watch someone feeling something, but the film's not telling you as an audience how to feel about that, um, and yes. that that it doesn't guide you or tell you or, yeah. or prescribe to you how you should feel about it. It. We just show you. Um, That's that was very important to both of us, and you know. For me as a director, um, I really love um, being given that space. I don't want to be told how to feel emotionally. I always react against whatever I'm told to do. <laughs> it's been like that since I've been a kid. <laughs> um, it's, it's, really, it's really beautiful when you see a film, and I'm happy if this one gave you that feeling too, that, that you can um, have your own feelings freely without you know, a sense of being manipulated. Yeah. Kirsten, were you going to say something? Oh, no, she just commented on something really nice that you guys answered, which was that Jane invites you into a film rather than tells you, you know, what to feel, which you answered. I think that way, too, you can go back to the film and see it again and notice different things, you know, that it, there's a, still a space that you can explore because there's more than one way in and one way through, you know? Yeah, and maybe hopefully, I remember you, Jane, and us saying that we wanted the film to be a, a strongly retrospective experience, that you experience the film in real time as you're watching it and then hopefully afterwards your experience somehow continues um, with your thoughts. And I think that also comes from a, a film that's not telling you at, at every beat this is how you should be feeling. It's, it's up to you to take what you see and, and put your own experiences and thoughts onto it. Um, and, yeah, I think that's really helps. I know for me, the first time I saw it, I, I couldn't, I mean, a very biased, but I, it was days of images coming back to you and thoughts and yeah. I don't think you're that biased. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think as, as an actor though, I think I speak for all of us, when we watched it, we were like, ah, oh, that's the film we're in. And that's again, even as someone who knows what we're trying to do in our, in our way, to be invited in as an audience, to, to have a spectator's experience when you're watching your own work is very, very rare. Um, testament to the masters on this stage. Thank you, darling. You're welcome.
welcome anytime. <laughs> all right, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. But I want to congratulate and thank all of you for you. being here. This is really lovely. Thank you for having us. Thank you all for coming.